Welcome to Value Education, Perspectives on Process. This is a series of conversations with administrators, teachers, and students about meaningful issues in education. Uh, today we are here with a very special guest, uh, Anne Palumbo, who is a science teacher in the middle and high school. And I'm also joined by my co-host, Dylan Spencer, who is in the 11th grade. So welcome, Ms. Palumbo. May I call you Anne? Yes, please. Okay. Well, Jeez. this is a chance to get to know you in a way that we might not otherwise get to do. So I'm very happy you're here. Um, first, I just uh, have always wondered where you come from. <laughs> um. Thank you for having me, Sally. Um, so I grew up right here in Harrison, um, and I went off to college at SUNY Cortland and studied abroad and lived here and there and came right back here to, to Westchester, um, you know, to, to work here at the Rhinex School District. Um, was this, this was not your first teaching job? It was not, no. So tell, get, go back a little <laughs> okay. bit more. Tell us a little bit more of your history. Um, yes, yeah, so I am a science teacher now, but I did not train to be a science teacher. Um, I always wanted to be a teacher, but I loved history. And so when I went to college, I actually studied history and politics and um, came out with a history degree and then couldn't get a job teaching history. And so the principal of my elementary school where I had gone as a kid actually had been following my career, I guess, and said, well, you have to come and teach for us. And um, they handed me a job teaching pre-kindergarten. So I had 24 four-year-olds for my first job. So I learned a little bit about classroom management. And then I went back to school to um, get a degree in early childhood education. Then they said, we need a science teacher. And you seem like a smart person. You should teach the science. And I said, but I don't know how. And so I went back to school and got uh, the biology certification and then the earth science certification and moved up through the grade levels. And here I am. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah. I just have one really quick question about yeah. teaching very young children in classroom management. Yeah. Um, I've been in near your classroom and inside and mm -hmm. seen groups of middle school students totally engaged mm -hmm. in science. Yeah. How do you create that? Oh, um, I don't know. I, I mean, the science is, is so interesting. And so, you know, I try to give people interesting questions and um, I try to just maybe give them an interesting problem and the tools to solve it. Like, uh, do you remember when we made the um, water filters? When yes. we said, yeah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> right? So, you know, we gave this problem that we have to, you know, we have this dirty water, what are we gonna do about it? And, you know, and then they just dig in if, if there's something fun and interesting to, to work with. So, okay. Done. No. <laughs> That's super cool. What sort of backtracking a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, what sort of initially inspired you to get into the the world of teaching, if you will? Oh, I just always wanted to be a teacher. I loved my teachers, Dylan. I just thought it was amazing that they knew everything, and it and all the subjects really interested me. Um, I just always wanted to be a teacher. Well, I don't know why. Did you have any role models? Um, you know, I, I love my teachers as, as role models, but also I was a Girl Scout for a lot of years, and the women are leaders in Girl Scouts, including my mom, my mom, um, <laughs> including my mom, were just really wonderful role models in that they wanted us to be competent at, at a whole variety of things. Um, so they taught us how to do everything, chop wood and make a fire. And um, we knew first aid and we could take a canoe 40 miles down a river and we knew what to do if it rolled over. And, you know, so, so these women, I think, were just my role models, that you could just get good at what you needed to get good at, 
by working at it, by learning and then practicing and working at it. So as a you know, Girl Scout, mm. it made me just think about the fact that there's been a lot of research on gender differences in science and how yeah. female and male students differ. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, I guess, because the female students are more likely, at least according to the research, to back off challenges, mm -hmm. whereas if a uh, young male student fumbles, he'll just say, hey, I'll get back at it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true, Dylan, but that's what the research says. Is, how, what is your perspective on you know, teaching girls and boys science? Yeah. I don't know if I see that uh, very much in Rynek. I, th I think our girls are quite empowered. Um, but what I, what I hope I see and give to my students is the message that, all right, you stumbled. That's fine. What are you going to do about it? There are things we can do about it. We can go back and, you know, try again and, and to just stay persistent. Um, and I, I think that's you know, male, female, either way, you mm -hmm. know, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, there's sort of the idea that um, in the real world, um, sort of problems come up that one may not really be able to uh, previously study uh, mm -hmm. in that there are problems that will exist in the future that us kids will not mm -hmm. sort of be able to prepare for exactly. Yeah. Um, how do you sort of work toward, uh, to provide us with those uh, universal or applicable tools that, that we can take uh, uh, certain, uh, in that we can take certain mm -hmm. ideals from a given problem set and apply mm -hmm. them to a whole new problem. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's a new and interesting question. Um, so I think what, what we want to try to do is always approach a problem from what piece of this do I know something about, right? And get a little foothold on that piece. And then try to develop from there, right? There's always something I know about something, right? So, so you just grab your starting point and then see if you can keep going from there. And I, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's so important for students to know is that you don't have to know all the answers or have studied the answers. You can, you can work your way toward the answers. Um, you know, again, with persistence, but, and yeah, with persistence <laughs> and, and, and with a, a can-do attitude, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're going to fail. We're all going to fail. And I had experience with that as a kid. I was really good at some subjects and I really struggled with others. And I, I tell students all the time, I did struggle with math. And so I had to learn to just keep at it over mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. um, and trust that I would get there eventually. Just as an aside uh, then, mm -hmm. you know, when students have to take tests yeah. and they're in a very process-oriented subject, yes. how do you balance that sort of end point of needing to take an assessment with a process that might be working differently for, for different students? I mean, can you like rephrase that? I, tell, I guess, tell me a little know, more Dylan, about what you're. That makes any you're... sense to you what I'm asking, but it just seems like um, for the student who needs a little bit more time, mm -hmm. um, are, yes. there, are there some tenets of the test? I guess in testing that you just have to reach a certain point at a certain time. Well, you know, we are in a system, you know, that has you know region exams and all that, and uh, yeah, eventually you do have to reach a certain point. Um, the beauty of science is that it, it continuously wraps around and, and comes back, right? Right? If you, right? You, you, you're going to revisit these things and add a little piece, and then you're going to come back to these basics and add a little piece. Um, so it does give you a chance to practice within the process of even learning something new. Yeah, and I'm sure. Question. Yeah, and I okay. think that probably when kids take assessments, it's a matter mm -hmm. of pride that they've sort of if it's an arrival point. So it, you it know, can that, be. Yeah, I hope it can be. Like, ooh, yeah. we got that. Finally. Well, we got but there. we have lots of yeah. students in the high school and, who are extremely enthusiastic about science and even want to double up on sciences and so on. So obviously, something's going really well. Yeah. 
to yeah. build that kind of enthusiasm. Yeah. So um, I just have one question because I, I didn't know this uh, really and I just want, I don't know whether our audience knows. Um, you teach both earth science and you teach environmental science. It would seem to me there's a lot of crossover, but what really is the difference between the two? Um, so in earth science, we study the things that are not alive uh, about the planet. We study the dirt, the rocks, the water itself, the air, how the weather you know, is created, and then space. But environmental, we study the integration of those non-living systems with the living systems. And we also study a lot about how humans are impacting those systems, uh, you know, these days. So. Okay. Um, how do you sort of model that, uh, that sustainability idea in mm -hmm. the dichotomy between um, humans and sort of the world we live in. Right. So this is a big deal now. We're, we're looking at a world where, you know, by 2050, we're going to have 9 billion people on the planet. That's a big deal. Mm -hmm. So we need to be smart and we need to use our resources as well. So, you know, one of the things I'm kind of famous for is um, reducing and reusing. So. Um, very often, you know, it, it's completely common in my classroom where I'll take a piece of paper and be like, here, here's your scrap paper. Just because there's something on one side doesn't mean we can't use this again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, people laugh at me because, you know, I think a piece of tinfoil is a treasure because I, I know what it takes to make that. You have to blow up half a mountain and you have to get these little tiny bits of ore and then you have to process them at high, high temperatures and it's such a... Mm -hmm. production to make tinfoil. So I like to always reuse things and when we do a project I'm often asking the students to take some old garbage and reuse it mm -hmm. like we did you know with right. that water filter. Yeah, yeah. Um, right now we're growing plants in the environmental class. Um, we're trying to create hydroponic systems for growing plants mm -hmm. but we're doing it with Garbage. So, like, I just plucked the bottles out of the out of the recycle bin and was mm -hmm. like, "Here are your supplies. Good luck." <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and then with the the sort of um, overwhelming uh, pressing matter of climate change, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. we sort of we kids um, feel like uh, I feel like we 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 often feel like. Um, there's this sort of um, this opportunity in school mm -hmm. to be given this sort of uh, Dylan, no, Dylan and I chat a lot. I think yeah. you're, where you're going is really uh, integration into curriculum. I think that's where yeah. you're going. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. So, like, where are the places where we can, you know, teach about climate change within the curriculum? And is yeah. that what you're? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so in um, in earth science, you know, we have a whole section on climate, and so we really integrate it there. Uh, and in, in environmental. Um, but one of the things that I think is important when I teach climate change, especially with kids, is that they're already a little bit scared. Some of them are a lot scared. Um, when they're doing independent projects with project-based learning, they're coming in to me as the expert, <laughs> um, it, with real concerns, they're worried. And so when I'm teaching it, um, especially now more than ever, I really focus on solutions. Um, the, the trees work, planting trees works. Um, alternative energy, like we were just talking about before, works. And trying to offer them the solutions that are out there and kind of reassure them. Um, and then, you know, I'll be cliche, but kids are the future. So if we can set that mindset, there are answers. Then, you know, we can move forward with this as a society, you know, and, and step into those answers. Do you think that the concern that they have for climate um, mm -hmm. translates into their uh, desire to take more science later in, in school? Because, I mean, there are chemistry classes and there uh -huh. are AP classes and all yeah. kinds of things for them to do? Um, 
I, I think there are, and I think that um, in the science research mm -hmm. programs, um, we're certainly seeing people doing projects that have to do with, um, with climate um, and, and solutions, climate solutions. Um, somebody just came to me today and said, I want to you know, go to college and I want to you know, be involved in, in earth science or ecology. And she was asking about, and, and she was talking about like wanting to help solve problems like this. That's a great perspective. Yeah, That's a really that great perspective. <laughs> um, but in terms of, you know, like the actual foundation of like lab work, for example, mm -hmm. um, how do you how do you inspire kids to keep going? You, you, we're kind of backtracking, but the tenacity that it takes mm -hmm. to do this if they've got pressing questions and they're looking at real world problems. Yeah. Um, what do you what do you say to them to keep them going? Um. I don't know. What do we say to them? Dylan's a former student. I don't know if you know that. So it's, it's interesting to sit with him. But I mean, one of the things that keeps me going and I hope keeps them going is that I'm continuously fascinated, you know, by the earth and by the work. And so every time, whenever I'm teaching these things, I'm like, come on, that's so cool. Isn't that cool? And I hope that that enthusiasm is transferring to the students. And I, I hope that's part of, you know, their drive forward. You know, maybe the test didn't go so well, but you still learned something really cool, right? So. Yeah. I, I, he's like, yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I think the, the general focus on grades makes it sort mm -hmm. of, uh, maybe detracts from that idea that yeah, it does. just learning uh, learning material, learning about the planet mm -hmm. is so important. Yeah. Um, but, but with that, um, where do you think we can sort of, uh, sort of diverge from, from norms and, and inspire students, specifically at Rhinec, um, in, in uh, sort of progressive education? Um, specifically in that, I know that we have uh, a new science science wing mm -hmm. being implemented. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so so with our science wing, um, some of the things that we're hoping to do um, as a department and, and as a school include the the wing is being built specifically with these collaborative spaces mm -hmm. in the center. So traditionally, schools, you know, you're in this your box and you do your thing in your box. So the, the building is specifically built to open those spaces up so that we could um, take the environmental class and the engineering class. Mm -hmm. And then maybe if we're looking at alternative energies, we could build something, you know, that um, in the engineering class with the environmental class and then go like take a paddle wheel and stick it in the stream. I was thinking of this the other day. We need to do this. We need to generate mm -hmm. energy mm -hmm. in our stream. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, building in that way, we hope will continue to foster even more collaboration mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that we can do these projects together. Right? It's you know, so, and that's yeah. different from yeah. what, you know, the traditional model is. It's funny you should say that because I also had a conversation about science today mm -hmm. with a student who has been introduced, I think, by you to hydroponics. Oh, yeah. And um, was discussing aquaponics. Yes. And how, you know, if there were solar panels, which I think the new wing mm -hmm. might actually it's, have mm -hmm. uh, at some point down the road, mm -hmm. um, that you can actually build self-sustaining systems with fish and plants and, yes. and electricity from the solar panels. Mm -hmm. And what an exciting thing for kids to get to do at school. And I think that's probably closer to what you were trying to mm -hmm. get at, which is that to have experiences that are real world and that are hands-on uh, at that level would like really make science teaching transcendent. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's really yeah. fantastic. Yeah to think about the engineering and the environmental kids together. What a great idea. And robotics and mm -hmm. all of the other, all the other things. Mm -hmm. um, which brings me to a question. Uh, what are your personal scientific interests? What do you really love? Um, 
Well, I, I really love my earth science, and uh, which makes people laugh because it's not usually the one that's loved, but I love it. And then also, my, I have a background as a fitness instructor as well, and so I really love and the workings of the body, anatomy and physiology. But the body has elegant systems, these elegant integrated systems, and I just love learning about them. Um, yeah. So, so that's what I do on the side there. <laughs> yeah. So you're known as a yoga teacher. I am. And mm -hmm. I know that through the Professional Development Committee, uh, you have very often offered yoga instruction for the faculty, and mm -hmm. you've had us, I've even been in your class. It's a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. How did you find yoga? Um, so I was a fitness instructor first, um, since college, and then, I don't know, we're just trying it out at the gym. Somebody was like, oh, you know, we've got this yoga class. And I'm very stiff. My whole body is just tightly wound together. And um, so I said, okay, it's supposed to be good for you. I'll try it. And I just loved it. I felt immediately better. And so I was hooked. And, and then um, at some point, they said, well, we need to expand the yoga program. You should teach that. So uh, I said, okay. And so I went back to school and I learned uh, how to teach yoga. Yeah. So there's, there's schooling and education involved in that yeah, as And well. another, yeah. teaching, another mm -hmm. teaching profession. Yeah. I know you had a question about yeah. the yoga. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, in, 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 in this sort of conversation of uh, mm -hmm. progressive education and, and, yeah. and doing things a bit more collaboratively mm -hmm. um, or differently to sort of inspire kids. Do you think there's room for mm -hmm. yoga to be integrated into the classroom? Um, yeah, absolutely. And I've been trying to do that a little bit more this year. So my yoga school, um, it's called Krupalu, and it, it um, collaborates with the Harvard Medical School to actually test why these mm -hmm. things work. So, so there's my science piece again. So I'm like, ooh, science. And so anything that's scientifically proven, I'm going to try out in the classroom. So, for example, before midterms this week, every day of the week leading up to midterms, we tried a different breathing technique. And I just said to the kids, let's do this as an experiment. Let's try breathing in this manner and see you know, mm -hmm. how you feel. Mm -hmm. Does it work for you? And here's why it's supposed to work. I just taught them a tiny bit about the brain science just for a few minutes. And then hopefully that would give different students some different tools to pull from because we know that anxiety you know, can, can come up around testing situations. So I was just giving them some tools to hopefully help with that. And understanding the science behind it. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting because I'm seeing so many kids interested in neurology. Have you seen yes. a growth in that? Yes. Yeah. They are. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not sure why. I, that's a good question. Maybe, I mean, it's a hugely growing field, and I think it's becoming mm -hmm. more mainstream for people to understand mm -hmm. how their emotions and their brains work together and how their bodies and their brains work together. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, it's just an it's an interesting uh, area because yeah. it's growing and genetics as well. Do you have kids interested in genetics? Um, well, they're probably not telling me about genetics because it's not you know it doesn't come up really in, in, Earth in my classes. <laughs> but but um, yeah, but thinking about the brain, it's interesting, or or the the neuroscience. I often will tell students why I'm asking them to do things a certain way. So um, one of the things I ask students to do is try to write down their notes instead of type their notes. And they grumble and they sing so old fashioned Miss Palumbo. But you know, the brain science is that writing mm -hmm. will integrate things into your brain more quickly than typing does, you know? And so, you know, I try to always tell them what their brain is doing and why I'm asking them to do things a certain way. Mm. So I hope that that's a little tidbit, yeah. uh, you know, self-reflection for themselves. Yeah. Well, I think context, don't you think so? Yeah. Context is like really important for creating relevance in terms of what yeah. you're learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Do, do you wish there were more things like that that you could do in terms of 
uh, do you feel like the curriculum yeah. or what, what you're required to do may sort of detract yeah. from that which you sort of feel would, would uh, provide in terms of education a lot for the kids? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, you know, we're on a tight schedule. It's a very big curriculum. And sometimes I wish I had a little more time to play around, you know, with these little side things. But, um, well, yeah. What would you do but, if you uh, could? Oh, my gosh. Dylan, <laughs> oh my gosh, I, my, every week it's something different, you know, yeah. because I just think everything's interesting. And like, whatever comes up that week, I'm like, oh, I want to try this. But, um, but uh, there's so many answers to that, I'm not sure. Hmm. We have uh, just uh, one sort of more question because we're going to have okay. to wrap in a okay. second. But um, what kinds of words of encouragement or inspiration would you like to offer students right now? They're yeah. looking at climate, they're looking at mm -hmm. coronavirus, um, all kinds of things. I don't want to bring that up. It's horrible. But yeah. what, what kinds of, what, what inspiring words can you offer to the kids? In terms of like their like their worries that, or, or the, just, th those kind of negative things. No, uh, no, but like or, it's a complicated world. It is a complicated world, and but there are so there's there are answers out there, and there's so many creative people with creative solutions, and many of those people are very young people um, as well, and so. I'm thinking of a fella named Boylan Slat, who who is uh, you, right. Yeah, um, yeah. He um, went out to I forget scuba dive, and it was, there was plastic everywhere. And he came back and decided and created, engineered this system for collecting uh, plastic out of the ocean. And it's working. Uh, I believe it's the rivers, right? specifically the rivers that go into the ocean. And now yeah, yes. he d changed, right? And so midway through, he kind of course corrected, realized that if you get it coming mm -hmm. uh, from the rivers, you don't, it won't even get to yeah, the yeah, ocean, yeah. course corrected. And so, you know, there, there are all these learning opportunities, mm -hmm. and there are people out there doing amazing things all the time. And so there are answers, and you know we can. Yeah. We're going to get there. And, and okay. yeah. we, we're going to have to wrap. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> we're have we, to see, wrap. we got all excited. Um, no, but there's obviously a lot more to discuss, yeah. and you know we're so happy that you're here. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say, with this last conversation with the rivers, mm -hmm. that um, Dylan is participating in Rhinex. TEDx conference. Yeah, uh, it is entirely focused on climate. And Dylan, I think you actually mentioned this uh, work in your talk. So it's interesting that you're both both excited by the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, to our audience, uh, we want to say thank you for watching. Um, I'm just going to put a shout out for a couple of things. One, we are having a TEDx independently produced conference on climate at Rhinec High School on March 20th. The conference will run from 6 in the evening to 9.30, and it includes youth speakers, exhibitors from our community, and also a lot of particip participatory activities. So we hope you'll look that up and maybe come. And I'd also like to give a shout out to the Litvin family for their wonderful support of value education. And join us next time. We look forward to seeing you then.